Hey everybody, welcome to the final lesson, lesson number 13 in this Bible study series we've been calling The Beauty of Restoration. It's a study of the last three and a half chapters of the Gospel of John, and today we will be in John chapter 21, verses 15 through 25. We're going to wrap up the study today. There is a listening guide for this lesson. You'll find it at the same place you found this video. Just scroll down and click on that link and download that PDF, and then you can print it out. Uh, there are some blanks to fill in during the teaching portion of the lesson, and there are some discussion questions there for you and your small group to go through after the lesson. You also will need your Bible or your Bible app open to John chapter 21. Before we jump into the lesson today, let's pray together, shall we? Father, we're so grateful. Uh, in fact, we don't really have the words to express how grateful we are uh, for spiritual restoration for the way you've made that available through Jesus. We are grateful for all the ways that it impacts our lives, for all the lessons that you've already taught us. And of course, Father, our prayer is that still today, as we open your word, that you will open our hearts and minds and that you'll help us to see through your eyes and that you'll help us to, to understand what spiritual restoration is all about in our lives. We pray, Father, that you'll change us as a result of this process, that every time we do this, that you, you make us a little bit more and more into the people that you've called us to become. We're grateful for that work in our lives. We're grateful for you, Lord. We love you and we love your word and its place in our lives. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we've been walking through the last weeks, days and weeks of Jesus's ministry. We've seen uh, his, his arrest and his trial and his, his, res, his uh, crucifixion, his death, his burial, his resurrection is where we've been in the last few weeks. And we're going to look at the very last, uh, the last appearance from Jesus as, as recorded in the Gospel of John. Uh, we're going to look at that today. In the last couple of weeks, we've talked about what spiritual restoration and doubt have in, what, what they have to do with one another, the role that they play with each other. And then also last week we looked at spiritual restoration and the calling that it places on our lives and how we need reminding of that. We're really going to see part two of that in today's lesson. Every week, just to remind you throughout this entire series, every week we've asked the same question. What does this passage show us or tell us or teach us about spiritual restoration, about that concept of being placed back into the love relationship with God that we were intended to be in from the outset. Uh, there has just been, uh, in, 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 looking at, in, in looking at what we've done, uh, we, we, we've just had this miraculous catch of fish, and what we're going to see in today's lesson is, quite frankly, what we've been waiting for 12 lessons to see. Uh, this whole unit started with Peter's denial of Christ, his denying that he even knew Jesus three times in one night, and how Peter was just devastated for having done that. He knew he, was, he had done Jesus wrong. Jesus predicted that he would do it, and then he did it anyway. Uh, and then the scripture says he ran out and whip, wept bitterly. And from that point until today's lesson, we have no mention of Peter. And so we can only imagine what's been going on with Peter uh, as you and I have been walking through the rest of the story uh, and seeing what spiritual restoration is about, Peter's been waiting for his own spiritual restoration all this time, and in today's lesson, we're finally going to get to see that take place. Uh, after this miraculous catch of fish that we looked at last week, uh, see, it was seeming, seemingly intended to remind these seven disciples, and there were seven of them in this, in this appearance, it was seemingly intended to remind these seven of the calling, the initial calling, the first time that Jesus said to each of them, follow me, come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of men. It seems to be designed to remind them of that calling and to tell them that calling is still important. We saw that last week. That's still the calling on your life. Uh, and what we saw last week is we saw Peter leaping out of the boat, a hundred yards offshore, leaping out of the boat and swimming to Jesus. He couldn't get to Jesus fast enough. I love that picture. And then they all come, uh, they gather there on the beach, they have breakfast on the beach with Jesus. It was a, a pre-planned event. Jesus put this together, this picnic breakfast together and planned it for these guys. 
And at some point in that experience, that breakfast with Jesus, at some point, what we get to in today's lesson is Jesus and Peter beginning to talk with one another, which is exactly what Peter has wanted to happen. Uh, I don't know, we don't know if the, if the conversation we're about to look at beginning in verse 15, if it started sitting around the campfire and then progressed to walking, or if it was from the very beginning, Jesus said, Peter, let's take a walk, and they walked together, and the whole thing may have taken place on this walk. We don't know that. We know that by the time they're at the end of the conversation, they are walking. We can see that from the context of the passage. But at any rate, we pick up here with this conversation between Jesus and Peter, beginning in verse 15. Here's what it sounds like. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And he said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he had said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Let's stop here and begin to unpack this. First of all, I think that it's true that uh, these three questions probably were sprinkled throughout a longer conversation. Uh, I doubt very much in the context of this, I doubt that they just happened back to back exactly as it's, it's stated here. I think that over the course of a longer, it's more likely that over the course of a longer conversation, this question came up time and time again. I guess it's possible that for, for, for purposes of emphasis, it's certainly possible that Jesus did it back to back this way. But in my, in my own mind, I have, a, I have just this picture of this coming up more than once over the course of a longer conversation. It's similar, kind of a Reader's Digest version of this conversation, with, which we know John was prone to do in his gospel. He did the same thing with regard to his account of the crucifixion as, and his accounts of the resurrection. There were plenty of things at the crucifixion that happened, we know from other gospel accounts, that John did not include. Plenty of things uh, that happened around the resurrection that John did not include. John gives us this very laser-focused version of all of these events, and I have a feeling that's what he's doing with this conversation as well. The conversation may well have started around breakfast, or it may all take place as they're walking along the beach, but when you get to verse 20, it's clear that they're walking by that time. I, I believe that this is a picture of restoration, but hear this. I do not believe that this is the picture of forgiveness. I believe that the conversation about Jesus forgiving Peter has probably already taken place. I believe it's most likely already been expressed. Now, I have to tell you, this is a change in my opinion. This is a change in my position just over the last week of my study. But we read in, uh, there are some veiled references Whenever Scripture is listing all of the ways that Jesus made appearances after His resurrection, uh, 1 Corinthians 15, 5, Luke 24, verse 34, Mark 16, verse 7, all of them make a reference to a meeting that we don't have uh, in Scripture. We don't have it recorded in any of the Gospels, but there apparently was a personal appearance that Jesus made to Simon Peter, and we believe it probably happened early maybe even on Resurrection Sunday. Um, and we don't have an account of it. We don't know what happened there, but I can only imagine the most important thing that, that Jesus and Peter needed to talk about after Jesus' resurrection was his forgiveness of Peter for that denial. And so I believe, I've come to believe, that that has probably already taken place, that forgiveness. What we're seeing here, though, is not forgiveness. It is rather restoration of Peter to become a leader and a minister again to carry out the calling that God's placed on his life. I believe that's what's going on here. Um, forgiveness would certainly have already taken place if that meeting took place between them. This conversation, though, seems to be the next step up from forgiveness. Of course, yes, Peter, I forgive you. You are forgiven. 
Uh, I think this is the next step up. Now can we talk about your ministry? Now can we talk about the calling I've placed on your life? It's time for you to step up and begin that calling. It's about the restoration of Peter to ministry. Some people see, some scholars see this conversation as installing Peter into some special level of authority or leadership. The Roman Catholics would say this is where Peter became the first pope of the Roman Catholic Church. I do see uh, Jesus restoring Peter back to ministry. I do not see anything here of Jesus restoring Peter to some special a place of ministry above everyone else. I'm not seeing that here, but I do believe this is a restoration of Peter back into ministry. I also no longer make much of the different Greek words that are used here for love. You may have heard this taught before. I will tell you probably a hundred times in my life I myself have taught the difference between phileo and agape. And yes, when John writes this, he's writing it in Greek, and he uses two different words. The way the, the, the phileo, the word phileo is a brotherly love. It's a, a, a kind of a lower form of love. Uh, agape is a higher form of love, an unconditional love, the kind of love we are called to in Christ. And when John writes this in, the, in Greek, in the conversation, what he says is, Jesus asks Peter, do you agape me? And Peter responds with, yes, Lord, I phileo you. And Peter, Jesus asks again, but do you agape me? And, and Peter says, of course, Lord, I phileo you. And then the third time, uh, John uses the word phileo from Jesus. Jesus says, do you phileo me? And it gives the impression of a lesser and a greater form of love where Jesus is saying, is that even true? You, you've not been willing to use the greater form of love. You've used this lower form, but is that even true? And Peter says, yes. Here's why I don't make much of that anymore. Uh, it, it, it was driven home to me in my studies this week that the, the reality is, though John was writing this in Greek, which would have used two forms of that word love, Jesus and Peter would not have been speaking Greek. They would have been speaking Aramaic and using the same word every time for love. And so I don't think that Jesus and Peter were using different words here when they were speaking about this. Moreover, what we know of John, and this is not something, I'm not a Greek scholar, so I wouldn't have known this if I hadn't learned it from other scholars, but what we know about John is, throughout John's gospel, he often uses the words agape and phileo interchangeably uh, to, to, to mean the same thing. Only John does that. Now, other writers, other authors, make a big difference between those two words, but John doesn't seem to draw that big distinction. So all of that to say, uh, I don't think it's insignificant that John uses these two words, and I think it's worth asking why did he, but I don't think it tells us that much about what was going on between Jesus and Peter because they weren't speaking Greek in the first place. I also believe that asking the question three times is important. I think that it corresponds perfectly and intentionally with the three denials. I think this is Jesus' love and compassion for Peter giving him the privilege and opportunity to not once, not twice, but three times, just like he denied Jesus three times, giving him the opportunity to, re, to restate his love, his devotion to Jesus three different times in order to make that right, in order to balance that out. Um, he gave him a chance to redeem himself for all three of those deni denials. Um, and also to be a little bit more humble and truthful because the initial question that Jesus asked him is, do you love me more than these? In other words, do you love me more than these other apostles love me? Why would Jesus ask that question? Because earlier, on, Je on the night of Jesus' crucifixion, Peter said to them, Jesus, long after all of these other guys have fallen away, I will still be willing to give my life for you. In other words, the implication was, I love you so much more than any of these other guys do. Even if all of them fall away, I will still give my life for you. That was a little bit of arrogance on Peter's part, and Jesus is giving Peter an opportunity to speak with truth this time and not out of arrogance. He's giving him an opportunity to, to show a little bit more humility in how he talks about his devotion for Jesus. Jesus says to him all three times, feed my sheep, tend my sheep. If you love me, show me. 
that you love me by feeding my sheep. Peter's restoration to ministry is a calling to love people in the same way that Jesus loved people. The good shepherd loves his sheep. And then this is a calling. Any calling to ministry is a calling to be a lover of God's people in that way. Peter's ultimate motivation for ministry, and by the way, our ultimate motivation for ministry, must be our love, our devotion to Jesus. That motivation makes for humble servants if we are loving the way Jesus loved. Restoration then often comes with a call to humble servitude. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in that first statement on your listening guide. What should separate Christian ministry from the best of the world's justice advocates is not what we do, but why we do it. We humbly serve others first and foremost because of our devotion to Jesus. Don't we serve out of our devotion and our love for those people? Yes, of course we do. But first and foremost, it is out of our devotion for Jesus. So Jesus then asks Peter, after reinstating him this way, after restoring him to ministry, he asks him, Peter, I need you to focus. That's what he's really doing here. Focus, Peter, on this calling. Focus on what I've asked you to do. Keep your focus no matter what. Look what he says in verse 18. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show by what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. What Jesus is doing here is he's foreshadowing for Peter that his life and ministry is going to be difficult. It's not going to be easy. It's going to be very difficult. In fact, it's going to lead him to his death. And Jesus is very upfront with that about Peter, really about with all of the disciples. He has reminded all seven of these disciples of his calling on their lives. And now he's paying particular attention to Peter with that same message. Remember your calling and know that this is not going to be easy. Jesus never promises an easy path to any of us. What he does promise is joy, but not necessarily happiness. Do you see the difference? Happiness is dependent upon our current circumstances. Joy is something much deeper that is not dependent on our circumstances. He promises us joy, not necessarily happy circumstances all the time, though. In fact, he promises us hardship. This is what he said to his disciples uh, on the cru on crucifixion night around that last supper in John chapter 15 beginning in verse 18 he says if the world hates you remember that it hated me first the world would love you as one of its own if you belonged to it but you're no longer part of the world i chose you to come out of this world so it hates you do you remember that i told what i told you a slave is not greater than a master since they persecuted me, naturally they will persecute you. And if they had listened to me, they would listen to you. They will do all this to you because of me, for they have rejected the one who sent me. What he's doing here is he's preparing these disciples for the hardships that are to come. Uh, every one of these guys would die a martyr's death at, because of what they believed about Jesus. He's preparing them for that. Uh, he, he, he's calling all, he calls all of us in that same way and prepares us in light of our restoration. If you have your listening to God, fill in the next statement. Spiritual restoration is not a promise of health or prosperity or even success by the world's standards. Indeed, the abundant life that follows spiritual restoration includes struggle and hardship. If you want easy, do not follow Jesus. So right after this call for Peter to focus, <laughs> Peter loses focus. It's really almost hilarious because it's the way Peter was. Right after Jesus says, Peter, focus, he loses his focus. Look what he says in verse 20. Peter turned and saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following them. That would be John. And the one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and said, Lord, who is it that is going to betray you? That's John. When Peter saw him, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, If it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. 
So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. But Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die, but rather, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? So Peter's first and immediate response to Jesus saying, focus, Peter, is to lose his focus. It's just so like Peter. We don't know what Peter's real question here was, what his underlying concern was behind this question. Maybe he's feeling competitive. Certainly we know that he and John seem to have a little bit of a competitive nature. Maybe he's genuinely concerned for John and just wants to know what's going to happen to John. Maybe he's just curious. Maybe he's just curious. Am I the only one that's going to have these hardships or all, are all of us? Who knows? We don't know what's behind it. But Jesus makes it very clear that none of that is Peter's concern. That, that what Peter needs to do is focus on Jesus. Now, I think Jesus is preparing Peter here not only for a ministry without Jesus. He's preparing all of them for that. We talked about that last week. He wasn't in the boat when they caught the fish. This time, as opposed to the first time, this time he was 100 yards away and they, caught the, they had the miraculous catch of fish. He's showing them, you guys are going to be able to do this without me. So one of the things he's preparing them for is that, but I think he's preparing them for something else. I think that Jesus is preparing these guys for the fact that they're not even going to have each other for most of the rest of their ministry. These guys are going to disperse and go off on their own and begin this revolution that we call Christianity, and they're not going to always get to be together. There will be times and moments and circumstances where two or three of them will be together, but largely they're going to be going in all different directions. He's preparing Peter for that, I think. He's saying, you don't need to worry about John. Peter, you need to worry about me. You need to be focused on me. Jesus is emphasizing that Peter needs to keep his eyes forward on Jesus and on his own calling and on his own ministry. That is such good counsel for all of us. Now, I will say this seems to me to be a little bit of a new message from Jesus. That's never, that's never been a part of his message to the disciples before now, other than the occasional sending them out and then bringing them back in. But otherwise... Uh, there's not been a lot of talk about you're not going to have each other all that much either. You're going to be forming your own communities of believers around where you go. Um, I, I, they've been together mostly. They're not going to be going forward. Our own spiritual restoration is likewise a call for us to focus. There will almost certainly be a community aspect to it, as there would be for the disciples. But restoration often brings a change in some of the relationships within our existing community, or in some cases, for some of us, it may actually, our spiritual restoration may be a call to a whole different community. We may be leaving a community and going to another community. Either way, spiritual restoration brings change to our community. Following Jesus often brings changes like that. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in the third statement. Our spiritual restoration almost certainly will include a community aspect, but it may require changes to our relationships within that community or even a new community altogether. Following Jesus brings changes that way. All right, then we have these beautiful closing words from the Apostle John uh, from, for the close of his gospel, beginning in verse 24. This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things. He's talking about himself and who has written these things, and we know that his testimony is true. Now there are also many other things that Jesus did. Were every one of them to be written, I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. It's good that John says this. We know that John's gospel is not one of the synoptic gospels. The synoptic gospels, Matthew, and Mark, and Luke, they're different than John's gospel. John takes a very different approach. John doesn't even attempt to talk about very many miracles. As a matter of fact, John's entire gospel includes only seven miracles in it. And we know of so many more miracles that Jesus performed, but John chose very strategically only seven of them to write about. Interestingly, John's gospel also includes throughout it seven statements of Jesus that we call the I am statements. Think about I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but through me. I am the bread of life. I am the good shepherd. 
just I am all by itself. Those I am statements, there are seven of them. And what John has done is he's chosen seven miracles and then he's chosen these seven I am statements. And these are the columns across which he drapes his story, all designed to answer the question, who is Jesus? That's what John's gospel does. So it's different in that regard. He has this laser focus, right? He's, he's really only choosing just a few um, signs and wonders, just a few moments to really focus in on. And then he gives us these deep, deep focus, laser focus conversations like the Samaritan woman at the well or Nicodemus. Only he gives us these conversations. John takes a different approach. But what he's saying here is there's so much more. Now let's think about this and you do the math with me. Jesus had three years, two and a half to three years of ministry. That that translates, if you only consider the daylight hours or the waking hours, let's assume he slept eight hours every night, right? So the waking hours in three years of ministry, that comes to 17,600 hours in those three years of ministry. Now, how many hours do you suppose are accounted for in all of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John? I don't think it's that many. In fact, I think it's very few. I think it would be I think it would be a really high estimate to say as many as 500 hours are accounted for, but let's just choose that number. What if, what if as many as 500 hours are accounted for in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Then what that means is all of Scripture gives us somewhere around 2% or less of the actual things that Jesus did and said. About 2%. Uh, during that ministry. This doesn't even count the first 30 years of his life. I'm not even counting the first 30 years of life about which we know almost nothing. So scripture in his ministry years, in his three years of ministry, gives us probably less than 2% of the waking moments with Jesus and what he did and what he said. And that's what John's saying. John is saying, oh guys, you have no idea how much there was to what Jesus did and what he had to say. Uh, in fact, it seems that we can receive, what, what, he, what he's saying here is spiritual restoration does not need to be, uh, my spiritual restoration, your spiritual restoration, their spiritual restoration even, it doesn't need to be grounded in knowing everything there is to know about Jesus. Spiritual restoration can come without much of that at all, right? Uh, we simply do not need to know everything about Jesus in order to receive the spiritual restoration that he affords us. Very little, very little known about Jesus, and yet we can receive spiritual restoration. I'm thinking about the thief on the cross. How much did he know about Jesus? And yet he received spiritual restoration. Jesus said to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. And so I, I think it's important for us to take that away and realize we don't have to be Bible scholars. We don't have to know everything in this Bible. We don't even have to know everything about Jesus in order to receive spiritual restoration. If you have your listening guide, let's fill in that last statement. Our spiritual restoration is not dependent upon how much we know about Jesus, nor about the Bible, nor even about God. It is strictly about our belief in who Jesus is and about our decision to follow Him. That's what spiritual restoration comes from. So what are our takeaways from this final lesson in this unit? Uh, number one, our highest motivation for ministry to others is our devotion to Jesus. Number two, following Jesus is a hard road with lots of struggles and lots of difficulties. We should know that right up front. Number three, our spiritual restoration will probably change some of our relationships, maybe even our entire community. And number four, our spiritual restoration is not dependent upon how much we know about Jesus. And isn't that good news? Guys, I have loved this study with you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for joining me through these 13 weeks. We're going to start a whole new study next week. I hope you'll come and join me for that. We're going to be looking at the Old Testament and key stories throughout the Old Testament. We're going to tell the story, tell God's story of the Old Testament and unlock some of the mysteries of the Old Testament, starting with next time's unit. And I love you guys. I hope you have a blessed week. Let's start a new unit together next week, shall we? Here we go.